So you might notice I've uh, changed the title of my talk. It, it used to be called Sensory Motor Understanding, and now it's called Sensory Motor Understanding. Uh, and that sort of reflects the fact that I'm uh, less sure about uh, the conclusions that I would eventually like to draw um, than I thought I would be. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of present what I'm now thinking of as the kind of initial stages of a research project about trying to understand sensory motor understanding. OK. Um, has the handout kind of made it all the way to the back yet? Oh, it's still working its way back. OK. So um, other preamble. Sorry, about, sorry that the handout is so faded. Our printers are running out of toner. And don't worry that the handout is quite long because it contains like pretty much literally everything that I'm going to say. OK, so here's the question that I want to talk about. Um, and the question is just, how can capacities for thought and knowledge arise from sensory motor interactions? So I'll say a bit more about what exactly that question boils down to and why it's interesting in a second. But here's the claim that I'm going to work towards. It's quite a, a modest claim, so I'll try and kind of say more bold and exciting things along the way. The uh, claim is that there's this kind of strand that I think I have discerned now in uh, Merleau-Ponty's project in the phenomenology of perception that I don't think people have paid enough attention to. And I think that strand aims at specifying a new, uh, what Merleau-Ponty would call sort of existential ground for the Kantian framework that I'm going to talk about in um, the middle part of this talk. On the handout, I say section three above. It should be below, but it's because I just kind of pasted that from the end of the handout. Um, so the claim um, that the unity of perception and of thought are characterized by the same form of motivational structure is essential to this project of Merleau-Ponty's. Okay? So if all goes well, uh, by you know, 25 minutes time, you'll understand uh, what on earth that might mean and why I think it and think that it's interesting. Um, before that, right, you might be wondering, section one, uh, Dave, this is supposed to be a talk about, uh, sorry, a conference about feeling reasons. What does any of that stuff you were just talking about have to do with uh, feelings and reasons? <clears throat> well, here's uh, the kind of motivating assumption and here's why I think it's, it's relevant. Understanding perception in terms of an active engagement with one's environment um, often, and I think it always should, involve understanding perception as having a sort of essentially motivating structure. Okay, so if anybody's kind of familiar with the sort of kind of active or sensory motor theories of perception that you find in um, <clears throat> Merleau-Ponty, in Alvanoe, in uh, Dan Hutto and other like an activist authors, <coughs> they appeal to <coughs> sensory motor contingencies um, in trying to understand uh, what perception consists in, how it gets its content, how it gets its character. Okay, so here are two kinds of sensory motor contingency that I think are involved in uh, perception. Understanding how the affordances of one's perceptible environment, like relate to one's intentions. Okay, so because of the sort of organism I am and my wants and needs, this coffee cup affords lifting up and drinking some of the coffee in it. Um, and because of the kind of perceiver I am, I just have this like automatic understanding of how the affordances of that cup relate to my current projects and desires of drinking some coffee or refraining from drinking some coffee. Okay. Um, so what's that got to do with feelings? Well, the idea is that in virtue of my perception having that kind of like motivational character, my perception kind of having that bearing on my actual and potential activity, um, it kind of means that there's a certain kind of feeliness baked into the perception, right? I'm kind of aware of features and properties and objects of my environment as things that are um, attractive or repulsive or otherwise motivating, right? Um, Second kind of sensory motor contingency, um, understanding the ways in which one's perception will vary with movement. <clears throat> so this is um, the sort of sensory motor contingency that's probably most familiar from like Alva Noe's like, work from the past like 15 years um, or so. 
his thought is that what is it to perceive, for example, the, the three-dimensionality uh, of this cup, even though you can only ever see the kind of facing side of it. For all you guys know, this could be like a, a coffee cup facade that I'm holding up to trick you. Um, but you can kind of see that it's, well, you, you experience it not as a coffee cup facade, but as a kind of voluminous three-dimensional cup because you have this kind of implicit understanding, at least some kind of understanding, um, of the ways in which you could kind of vary your perceptual relation to it to bring other aspects, other sides of the cup um, into view. Um, so one instance of that kind of sensory motor contingency is just like a sense of what it would be to kind of get a better or a worse view um, of, of the object that you're perceiving. So Merleau-Ponty has this example um, of perceiving kind of paintings in an art gallery. And he says, look, for every painting, there's a kind of optimal kind of perceptual relationship that you, could, that you can stand in with respect to it. Um, for most paintings, you don't want to stand kind of like right up close to them, but you don't want to stand, you know, right at the other end of the room. You want to be somewhere in between. The same is true if you're kind of trying to perceive um, a person, right? And maybe like perceive what a person is feeling. You can't do it very well if you're like right up against their skin. Uh, you also can't do it very well if you're kind of right at the other end of um, a big park or something like that. You've got to be somewhere in between. And baked into your perception, the thought goes, is a kind of sense of like where you are with respect to that optimum. Okay. So again, like this kind of the idea is this motivational structure figures in perception, um, and that kind of manifests as a kind of feeling, right, of you know how things are going, like what I could do to make my perception be going better or worse. Okay. So that's why I think that um, feelings, in in some sense, I can talk or I can try to talk uh, in questions about like what yeah whether the feelings are kind of affective states emotional states uh, something else um, that's why I think that feelings have like uh, a bearing on these issues that's why I think that these issues about sensory motor understanding have a bearing on feeling and feeling reasons okay so section two on the handout this is kind of important for um, just motivating the rest of the talk, right? Why well, think that there's any interesting problem about how capacities for thought and knowledge could arise from sensory motor interactions? Um, and this, you know, in a way, it seems like a pressing question because um, if you kind of look at the literature that tries to argue that capacities for thought and knowledge um, arise from sensory motor actions, I think that the move is often made kind of very quickly. So, um, the claim that um, capacities for thinking and knowing things are grounded in somehow, capacities for sensory motorically interacting with one's environment, um, is kind of familiar from various places in the phenomenological literature. So Heidegger famously said that the capacity to, to think or know something like, um, this hammer is too heavy for this particular job. Um, the capacity to have that thought, have a thought with that structure, depends on more fundamental capacities to actually kind of get on with doing the job of hammering and to have a sense of how well or how badly um, <coughs> your hammering is currently going. Okay? So the thinking capacity depends on the sensory motor interaction capacities. Similarly, in Merleau-Ponty, um, inspired in large part by uh, Heidegger, uh, the capacity to think or know about the perceptible world depends on a more basic, uh, more fundamental form of pre-reflective, non-conceptual, motor-intentional directedness. Okay. I'll be saying more about what on earth that might mean um, in a second. Um, but here's a quote where he's, people interpret him as saying something like this. Uh, in perception, we don't think the object, and we don't think the thinking. Um, instead, we're just directed towards the object, and we merge with this body that knows more than we do about the world. Um, so my kind of impression is, in a lot of philosophy of cognitive science, uh, a kind of like argument form goes, look at these cool phenomenologists and these exciting things that they say. Um, they say that our capacities to kind of think and know and be rational are grounded in our clever bodies being able to do all this stuff. Well, that, that seems good enough. OK, off we go. Problem solved. Um, but here's a reason for thinking that um, we can't move quite that quickly. Okay. 
And for anybody who's kind of had a look at the, the kind of exchange from about, uh, yeah, started exactly 10 years ago now between um, John McDowell and Hubert Dreyfus on these issues, this is kind of what I have in the back of my mind here. OK. So here's a worry for the attempt to ground rational capacities in sensory motor capacities. OK. Episodes of thought and knowledge, uh, plausibly, essentially belong in the space of reasons. OK. Um, by that, I mean that those episodes, they're the sorts of things that can be justified, they can be rationally entailed, and they can themselves kind of confer justification on other states, uh, and they can entail other things. OK. Now, the problem is going to be that the sorts of sensory motor interactions that people like Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty and Alva Noe, other activists, appeal to don't look like they belong in the space of reasons. OK. So if that's true, then it seems unclear, or like at least seems like there's a philosophical problem about how we can put them in touch with capacities for knowledge. OK. To make this uh, seem a bit more pressing, like perhaps, you might like think about the difference between um, reliable differential responsiveness to an environment um, on the one hand and the capacity to think or know about an environment on the other hand. So it's really easy to have a capacity to reliably differentially respond to an environment. Lots of like really stupid robots have it. Um, iron and iron filings have it. Okay, so on the handout, iron reliably differentially responds to the presence of moisture. Um, in the environment by rusting, but iron doesn't kind of perceive moisture or know anything about moisture. Okay, so this kind of, for instance, capacity to just like be causally related to your environment in such a way that you can reliably respond to it in certain kind of like law-like ways doesn't suffice to kind of put you um, in the space of reasons. In fact, it seems like an exact kind of contrast case, right, with being in the space of reasons. Okay. So and it, on the face of it, it seems like these kind of sensory motor interactions are more like kinds of reliable differential responsive, responsiveness, just propensities to interact and causally hook into your environment in various ways. So it looks like there's this puzzle about what they have to do with these space of reasons capacities. OK. So some sensory motor theorists kind of appeal to capacities for sensory motor understanding at this point. They say things like, look, um, obviously, for example, an assembly line robot um, has or stands in certain kind of sensory motor relations to its environment, but it's not experiencing, it's not knowing. But that's because it doesn't have this kind of sensory motor understanding of what's going on, right? It doesn't understand the sensory motor contingencies. Um, now, that might be a perfectly sensible and helpful thing to say in some contexts, but it's not helpful um, in this context, right? To see why it's not helpful, just think of like what what does sensory motor understanding mean there? Okay, either it means something that you know some form of understanding, some form of knowledge or mindedness that is in the space of reasons, in which case um, it's kind of presupposed the sort of thing that we wanted to explain, um, or it means something much more kind of like lightweight, um, like maybe kind of sensory motor understanding just means. Well, there are kind of like, say, four or five behavioral routines that the system has, and it can reliably toggle between them in an adaptive fashion. OK, well, if sensory motor understanding just means something like that, then it looks like it still belongs in the kind of space of causes, space of causal interactions. So it doesn't help us with this puzzle about how sensory motor capacities um, can kind of hook us in to the space of reasons. So um, here's McDowell's way of uh, spelling out what he thinks the kind of ultimate underlying problem here is at the bottom of page one. <clears throat> How can perceiving uh, a cup on a table allow me to know or entitle me to assert something like um, the cup is on the table if my perceptual relation to the cup doesn't have the structure of a thought, by which he just means um, conceptual structure? Okay. So McDowell is famous for claiming that all perceptual experience, and in fact he thinks all um, intentional activity, has this conceptual structure. And that's why he thinks that you know, he doesn't have any problem like explaining how perceiving the cup puts me in a position to know that there's a cup on the table. 
because the kind of concepts that I draw in, in having the perceptual experience of the cup are exactly the same as the concepts that figure in my thought the cup is on the table. Um, now it looks, at least from the way that I've presented the kind of sensory motor ideas about perception so far, um, that they can't help themselves to anything like that picture. Um, because, for example, if you look at my kind of bullet point about Merleau-Ponty, the way in which he tends to be drawn on in the sensory motor literature is to think, ah, oh, well, Merleau-Ponty kind of says that we have this unreflective, non-conceptual um, mode of interaction with our environment. Um, and so McDowell's kind of question for that kind of picture is exactly, well, how could anything that's like unreflective and non-conceptual be the sort of relationship to my environment that puts me in a position to know things and judge things and infer things. Okay, so that's why uh, I think we should think that there's a problem about how capacities for thought and knowledge could arise from sensory motor interactions. Now, um, I already very quickly said what the McDowellian form of the solution is, right? It's just to say, um, that all human perception is conceptually structured. Okay, so um, he kind of denies that perceiving a cup on a table could allow me to know or entitle me to assert something like the cup is on the table um, if my perception didn't already have the structure of a thought. And the way that he tries to, tries to spell that picture out is by just kind of basically agreeing with a bunch of stuff that Kant says, or at least stuff that he interprets Kant as saying. Okay, so here are some famous things that Kant says. Uh, a lot of you might be familiar with some of these things. Famous thing number one, thoughts without content are empty, intuitions without concepts are blind. It is therefore just as necessary to make our concepts sensible, that is to add the object to them in intuition, um, as to make our intuitions intelligible, that is to bring them under concepts. Okay. So what's going on in that little soundbite is that intuitions for Kant are just like episodes of sensory consciousness. And what Kant is saying there is like if sensory consciousness is going to be the sort of thing that can tell us anything about the world, can inform us uh, about the world, then it needs to be already integrated with capacities for thought. Again, McDowell's like way of spelling that out is just to say all perceptual experience has conceptual structure. The flip side, which is in the kind of other part of the, of the quote, if thought is going to be the sort of thing that has a bearing on reality, which obviously you know, it would be nice if it was, um, it must be integrated with our capacities for sensory experience. Okay, so the sorts of things that we think must be the sorts of things that we can also in some way experience. Okay. So then the puzzle for this kind of Kantian picture be becomes how can intuitions and concepts kind of speak the same language? How can they talk to each other? And here's what Kant says about this. I mean, anybody who's tried to read Kant will know that he has uh, a lot to say, like you know, hundreds of uh, very dense and sometimes inscrutable pages to say. But here's what McDowell thinks is the most kind of important sentence that he has to say about this. The same function that gives unity to the various representations in a judgment also gives unity to the mere synthesis of various representations in an intuition, right? So. What's going on there is that when I do something like judge or think uh, this cup is on the table, what my mind is doing is kind of like unifying, bundling together the various elements of uh, that proposition, the cup is on the table, um, <clears throat> in you know, the way that is distinctive of that thought, okay? Kind of glomming together all the elements of the thought in a particular way. So Kant's idea is that, right, so judging involves kind of bundling elements together up in a particular way, um, and so does seeing, right? So when I can see that the cup is on, in the, on the table, that involves me kind of seeing all the kind of different elements and properties of the cup um, as hanging together in a partic particular way, seeing them as in some sense independent of and distinct of the table that forms the background of the cup and all the other stuff that is going on over there. Okay, so again, there's this kind of like bundling up of elements that is common to both thinking and perceptually experiencing, and Kant's thought is that that bundling up is the same kind of thing, it's the same capacity, it's the same activity in both cases, and that's why intuitions and concepts are the sorts of things that can talk to each other. Okay. Um, last,
Kantian catchphrase, okay, it must be possible for the I think to accompany all my representations, for otherwise something would be represented in me which could not be thought at all. And that is equivalent to saying that the representation would be impossible, or at least would be nothing for me. Okay, so this just means that the capacity for self-conscious thought is crucial for Kant. Um, if it, there's going to be a world-directed state in my mind, then it needs to have its content in a way that I can think about, right? It needs to have a, its content in a way that's thinkable by me if it's going to be a state of my mind, okay? So, put even more simply, if there's anything kind of going on with me in my mind, it needs to be the sort of thing that I could focus on or like entertain in thought. Okay. So, that is all just a specific way of getting us to the kind of general statement of McDowell's position that I already gave. Okay, so McDowell kind of adds these claims up um, as his way of spelling out the claim that uh, everything I can rightly be said to experience and also do has a form that makes it thinkable by me. Um, in other words, all perception and all action as well uh, is conceptually structured. Okay, very last thing, super quick. McDowell also thinks, and he kind of thinks that this is kind of entailed by the Kantian framework, but I couldn't find a nice kind of soundbite from Kant that uh, explained it. Um, he thinks that kind of having this sort of conceptual structure just entails a capacity on the part of the subject to like step back from their experience or their activity. Um, and if it's a perceptual experience, you've got to be able to kind of step back and wonder if things really are as they appear, okay? So you've got to kind of be related or be potentially related to your experience such that you can realize, you know, maybe things aren't quite right. You know, maybe I need to kind of change my experiential relationship to the environment. If it's the case of activity, then you can step back uh, from your engaged activity and wonder whether you have a, really have a good reason for doing what you're doing. Okay. Now, it's important for McDowell if his position is going to be uh, at all plausible. Um, so you know, he emphasizes this, that this is a capacity that um, it doesn't have to be exercised. And in the vast majority, 99.9% you know, .9 of cases, we won't be exercising such a capacity. You know, usually we just get on with experiencing the world and acting in the world and don't do much stepping back and thinking about it. But for McDowell and for Kant, um, the kind of crucial thing that gives our um, thought and experience the structure that it has is that capacity to step back and think about it. OK, so last section. Um, McDowell thinks that in saying all this stuff, right, he's um, chucking important parts of the sort of phenomenological tradition that I alluded to out the window. OK, so McDowell thinks that Merleau-Ponty is insensitive to those sorts of points that we just went through. For example, when Merleau-Ponty writes things like uh, the quote that I already, write out, already read out, um, in perception, we don't think the object and we don't think the thinking. Instead, we're directed to the object and we merge with this body that knows more than we do um, about the world. So there, uh, McDowell thinks that Merleau-Ponty is doing this funny thing of saying, well, we've just got like a body and it's very clever. It knows all about the world um, and it's kind of taking care of all the kind of relating us to the world. And we, you know, our mind, our intellect somehow like merges with it. McDowell thinks that that is a stupid thing to think. Um, and I think that you know, he, he is correct in that. But importantly, it's not what Merleau-Ponty thinks. Okay, I think Merleau-Ponty understands all the Kantian stuff that McDowell uh, just mentioned. I think Merleau-Ponty kind of accepts it all in a way and tries to kind of go beyond it and put it on a slightly different footing. Um, I'm going to skip over 4.1 in the interests of getting some questions in. Um, but that's just the part where I say, here are some quotes that suggest that you know, Merleau-Ponty understands all that stuff and is sympathetic to trying to do justice to this broadly Kantian project. I can talk about why, why exactly I think that um, in Q&A, if people are interested. OK, so how does he try and kind of, I kind of said, go beyond, but also kind of um, Merleau-Ponty thinks of himself as trying to sort of properly found this Kantian project? What does he have to tell us? Well this main clearest contribution that he has is trying to get us to think about the sort of synthesis and bundling together that's involved in perception in a particular way. 
Okay. So Merleau-Ponty agrees that perceptually experiencing unified objects involves bundling things up. But where Kant understands that unification, that bundling up in terms of sort of capacities of a transcendental ego that kind of dictates the structure of rationality, Merleau-Ponty thinks that we need to understand that in terms of kind of contingent forms of skillful bodily activity, modes of perceptually investigating and exploring the environment. Now, I kind of think that the, the basic idea here is really like intuitive and plausible. So just think of the last sort of new um, bodily skill that you acquired. Hopefully everybody, you know, acquired some new bodily skill like in the last living memory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so like exam examples on here and think about the way that it kind of has restructured your experience of the world in a way. So examples I could think of here, you know, think of like learning how to play the guitar. Okay. And when you're like learning, you've got to kind of remember, oh, so, you know, this finger goes here and this one goes here and it all feels very like unwieldy and uncomfortable and wrong. Um, but once you've kind of learned how to do that stuff with your, with your body, you kind of experience that configuration in a way that is in an important kind of phenomenological sense unified. You also kind of experience it as meaningful and significant because you can produce chords and you know, you can go transition into like other different chords. Okay. So in virtue of like acquiring some bodily skills pertaining to the guitar, your experience of, you know, your proprioceptive experience, your tactile experience of um, your fingers on the strings kind of acquires a different unity than what it had before. Okay. Um, I think Merleau-Ponty's kind of most extended example of how he thinks we should think about synthesis is binocular vision, sorry, unifying images in binocular vision through focusing. Okay, so we can all do this together now. Okay, so fix your uh, gaze like on a point kind of in the distance, like maybe somewhere up here. Now, without kind of changing the point that you're gazing at, kind of notice how stuff um, this kind of intermediate objects appear to you. Okay, so I'm kind of like looking at that camera like on the back wall now. Um, I can see sort of in the periphery of my, my vision, like, you know, there's, I know that there's a, a wine glass there, but it's kind of like blurry and like doubled. Okay, without kind of changing where I'm looking, well, I did sort of change where I'm looking, <laughs> with, but without kind of like moving my head and eyes around too much, I can kind of change where I'm focusing. Okay, so you, you do that too with whatever you were looking at. So you can see the kind of images like coalescing, right, like snapping together. And you can kind of shift it back to what you were looking at before. And you can see uh, the background sort of snapping into sharp focus and the foreground going out of focus again. Okay. So again, this is an example of the elements of our sensory experience kind of changing their structure, okay, being bundled together um, in a different way depending on what we're doing. Okay. Now, how should we think about that? <clears throat> well, bottom of page three now, bringing blurry or double images into focus isn't a matter of judging that they correspond to a single object, right? Because I'm judging that the kind of blurry, fuzzy wine glassness on the periphery of my vision belongs to a single object all the time, but that doesn't do anything like, until I actually kind of like focus on it differently. Um, nor, Merleau-Ponty thinks, can we make the kind, this kind of like focusing activity and what it does to our experience intelligible just by kind of appealing to subpersonal goings on. Although importantly, I think he thinks that an appeal to subpersonal goings on is going to be a partial explanation, right? We're going to need to do it at some point. But he thinks that it's kind of crucial to our experience of what's going on and the structure of what's going on that we kind of experience a relation between uh, the focusing um, and the, the kind of unifying of the images and our kind of intentional act of focusing our gaze, right? So I was getting you to do something that you're always kind of like throughout your waking life um, unreflectively and like constantly doing, kind of changing the way your gaze is distributed around the scene, changing where your focal attention is going. The kind of distinctive thing about, you know, just holding up wine glasses and like looking at the back of the room is that you're attending to it, which you don't usually do. Um, but Merleau-Ponty Merle wants to say, nonetheless, even when you're kind of doing it unreflectively, automatically, it still counts as a mode of intentional activity in a sense that Merleau-Ponty has a lot of things to say about. Okay. So 
bottom of page three, the aspects of sensory consciousness that get bundled together in sy synthesis, we shouldn't understand them as related via judgment um, in the sort of way that Merleau-Ponty thinks that Kant or a Kantian would want to do. So we don't deduce or infer a single object from two blurry images. And we shouldn't understand them as related via mere kind of causes. So just the kind of sensory presence of two blurry images isn't enough to kind of automatically make them kind of snap into resolution, despite you know, whatever my uh, information processing mechanisms might be doing. We need the kind of intention to focus as well. Instead, Merleau-Ponty thinks, one passes from double vision to the unique object, not through an inspection of the mind, but when the two eyes cease to function in isolation and are used as a single organ by a unique gaze. The synthesis isn't accomplished by the epistemological subject. So he's saying it's not a matter of kind of like judging and sort of standing back and surveying different sensory images, um, but rather by the body, where it, where it, when it tears itself away from its dispersion, gathers itself together and carries itself through all of its resources toward a single term of its movement and when a single intention is conceived within it through the phenomenon of synergy. So that last part of the quote is a bit of a mouthful, right? But to kind of get a sense of like what he means, uh, think of the way in which you know, your attention might be focused somewhere, um, all your attention, so say all your attention is like focused on me, right? You're kind of peripherally aware on stuff that is going on over there and over there. If there's a kind of like loud explosion or over there or over there, that's going to automatically kind of instantly reorient your attention by virtue of kind of changing your kind of um, practical relationship to the environment. Okay, you're going to be like, well, what's going on over there? I want to get away from it. Okay, so it's changing your intentional set with respect to the environment in a way that kind of automatically implicates this change in perceptual relationship. Okay. Now, Merleau-Ponty like, has more to say about how we should think of the relationship between elements that are getting synthesized there. Um, and this is just to bring it back to the initial things that I was saying about the sort of motivational structure of experience. Okay. So he says in various places, think about the relationship between sensory appearances um, and the kind of perceived objects that they put in touch with as ones of motivation rather than kind of reasons or causes kind of alternatives that I was dismissing earlier, earlier on with the help of the kind of blurred vision example. Okay, so in terms of that example, given my intention to kind of see a particular object, whatever it is that I want to be looking at, um, the kind of blurriness I experience it is something that kind of motivates or solicits me to kind of focus, to change my perceptual exploration of the environment in a particular way and see a single object. Okay, so Merleau-Ponty's conception of perceptual synthesis, perceiving unified objects depends on embodied skills that allow us to experience the scene as soliciting or motivating particular modes of interaction um, and exploration. Okay, now, um, this is the part that, uh, yeah, where I think it becomes a research project, okay. So given this way of thinking about perceptual synth synthesis, can Merleau-Ponty agree with Kant that um, first, no, second sound bite that we considered from Kant, the same function which gives unity to the various representations in a judgment is also what gives unity to the mere synthesis of various representations in an intuition? Well, the more I kind of think about this and the more that I look at passages in the phenomenology of perception, I think that that is exactly what Merleau-Ponty is trying to work towards. Okay, so... Um, Let me, let me kind of skip the two chunks about um, Schneider. It's like an interesting case. Maybe I can talk about him in questions or in the pub. But here's what I think that Merleau-Ponty ultimately wants to suggest. Okay, just as the synthetic relationship between the aspects of a sensory episode depend on the kind of motivational and hence kind of feely, feel-involving structure in terms of which they hang together, the unity of the elements in a judgment, I think Merleau-Ponty wants to suggest, depends on the way in which they're experienced as related to each other and the sense of the whole. So he has kind of various examples, right, that point this way. For example, um, we kind of get metaphors or analogies before we can kind of explain what exactly is going on, before we can put into words what's going on in the metaphors or analogies. Um, the way in which we kind of experience 
um, stories, right? We experience uh, a set of facts or a kind of causal sequence of events um, as a story only if we can kind of experience those events as hanging together with a particular like uh, emotional cadence, right? with a particular kind of feely structure. And forming political or religious convictions, this is on there because it's something that his kind of case study patient like Schneider claims not to be able to do, plausibly depends on coming to feel and be motivated by facts and situations in a kind of new way. <clears throat> so these are all kind of cases that we'd kind of associate with, you know, at least if not kind of straightforward kind of um, thought and judgment. They're like higher cognitive capacities. And I think what Merleau-Ponty is up to in crucial parts of the phenomenal, uh, phenomenology of perception is trying to argue that that kind of same motivational structure that we saw accounts for the unity of a perceptual experience for him accounts for the way in which things in kind of like stories or metaphors or political worldviews hang together um, in something like a thought. Okay, and that's all I have to say. Mm -hmm.